All right, so day two of our Android class, uh, you've had one day or so, two days, two and a half, one and a half days, to think about trying to do this at home on your own computer. And so, how many of you have tried to do this on your own home computer? Great. How many of you has it gone smoothly? Okay. How many of you not so smoothly? How many of you, you almost threw the computer out the window? Okay. So we're seeing here that range, that uh, it's doable, it's attainable to be able to create apps and all of that, but it does require an investment of time, effort, and money. And so if you have an older computer, laptop, or desktop, it might be a little bit more challenging. Uh, if you've got a non-compatible device, it might be a little more challenging, but all of this stuff at least is available for us to, to do. Because the barriers to entry to do this on Android are, are much lower. You can create an Android app on a Windows machine, on, an, uh, on a Mac machine, on a Linux machine. You can make an Android app on any kind of computer, basically. If you're going to make uh, an app for Windows devices, you have to do it on a Windows machine. You can't do it on a Mac easily. And then if you're going to make a um, if you're going to make a uh, an iPhone uh, app, you have to make it on a Mac. You have to have access to a Mac uh, easily. So Android really is the universal one that you can create an app for it on any kind of computer. I forgot to bring my iPhone in at the moment to show you, but um, to do uh, your uh, iPhone development, I'm, I'm further looking into it because there's so many things to learn and, and to convey. I'm trying to get all of the bases covered also to talk about iPhones if, if we can uh, because we've seen Taco uh, platform add iOS. In theory, that's what we need. In practice, we need also the hardware. And from my further reading, it looks like that if we are able to access uh, a Mac a remote Mac that is properly set up, we can actually then create our apps and compile them from our Windows machines that still need to be connected to a Mac machine. It's kind of complicated if you're doing it that way. If you're right on a Mac, it's just taco create iOS and it's done. But on a Windows machine, you have to set up a little bit more. Question. Yes. Can taco be run in GUI like uh, Visual Studio? Yes, taco actually there's two versions of it. There's the taco that uh, is the command prompt, which is what we're doing, and there's also taco for Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Taco Tools for Visual Studio, and uh, you can actually use taco, uh, specifically Cordova, in Visual Studio. Cordova or taco? Same thing, so. pretty much, because taco runs on top of Cordova, and then uh, Cordova is the basic of it. And uh, that reminds me, if everyone would like to do this, uh, if you open up your web browser, you go to youtube.com. Um, I guess we'll do it directly. youtube.com slash PMD Interactive. So as I said, I, I, I teach, but I also am part of a company, PMD Interactive, and we do websites, Hello everyone. This is programming, Victor from apps, all of that. We've got a YouTube Let's channel here, and I've got a video for you to check out, specifically on answering that question. YouTube.com slash PMD Interactive. And there is a video, if you look under the Videos tab, Build an Android app with Visual Studio 2015 in 5 minutes. That basically is the five-minute video on uh, how to set up Cordova for Visual Studio. And the great thing is that with Visual Studio Community Edition, it's totally free. Visual Studio Enterprise, or whatever they call it, is like $1,000. But Visual Studio Community Edition is free. And it has Cordova, also known as Taco. And if you follow that video and follow along, you can make uh, apps on Visual Studio for Android, for Windows, for Mac, or iPhone through Visual Studio. So I myself uh, am pretty amazed that Microsoft, Microsoft is doing a lot of open source stuff. Microsoft is really getting cross-platform because they're seeing 
the decline of the PC and the rise of mobile devices, and they were late to the party. Uh, Android phones are dominant. Second place is, uh, is, I, is iPhones. And third place, distantly, is Windows phones. So 2%, 3% on a good day. And then you've got 5% on a good day. And you've got uh, Android, 80%, 85% iPhones, 20%, 25%, Windows Phone, 3%, 5%, depending on the year. So Microsoft, Microsoft is late to the party of mobile. They're still dominant. Uh, Windows machines are still dominant worldwide. 80% of computers in the world are Windows computers. Uh, but they've seen the writing on the wall, and now they've got Visual Studio Community Edition, totally free. And you set yourself up, follow, the, follow our video and you'll be able to do what we're doing here but with a nice safe graphical user interface you don't want that you want the command prompt you just type commands and you're done you don't want to wait for a 20 gigabyte download uh, to set all of that up um, when you can just type taco create Android and you're done but um, this video of ours seems to have been a hit it's got about 20,000 views now so it looks like people are actually looking at it and, and liking it and yes, it is clickbait. You cannot literally create an Android app in five minutes. The video lasts five minutes, <laughs> but you'll but you'll be able to but you'll be able to get up and running faster than you would in the old days. In the old days, you know, five months ago, because <laughs> this stuff changes so fast. And uh, if you liked that video, don't forget to also watch the other video. What would you like to learn next? Uh, watch it, like it comment it, and then we'll see what happens. But uh, for today, then uh, we have a new handout that I gave at the end of the day. So let me remind you where everything is at again. Uh, remember, you have to be on our computer. You On your laptop, you don't have access to our network. So open up computer window, network location, classroom data Z. Scroll down to find Campus Android 2. And last time I gave handouts 3A and 3B. Uh, I'll turn the printer on a little later. But you should copy 3A and 3B. You're only going to need either 3A or 3B. You're not going to need both. You don't quite know which one you need until you start to actually do this. But I'm going to start to look at Campos 3A, set up a modern device. The other one is set up a uh, set up a set up an older device, and that is dependent upon you know what kind of device you have, which we'll see in just a bit. Uh, where has the uh, pink sign-in sheet ended up? Pink sign-in sheet. All right, so let's look at 3A. Now, if you brought your device and the, and the uh, cable, don't plug it in yet. Notice at the very top, do not plug in your device yet. So let's read instructions first. Do not plug in your device. This is to set up a real device. Last time we set up a virtual device. We're going to do that again together also uh, later on in just a bit, or you can set it up. If you don't have a real device to work with, I recommend uh, just wait a moment, read the previous instructions, and we will uh, get back to the virtual devices. But uh, we've got here, every Android device is different. Follow these steps, and they are approximate. What you need to do, first of all, is to set your device as a developer's device. And so the developer's device setting doesn't mean you're going to jailbreak your phone, doesn't mean you're going to void your warranty or anything like that. It just means you're going to activate a feature on your device to let you side load apps, which means to um, be able to install uh, apps from without the official um, Google Play Store. Uh, let me actually show you something here so that let me show you something here actually so that everyone can can see what I'm talking about in the instructions. The um, the instructions tell us that you have to turn on developer options. 
For some devices, it's going to be exactly as what my instructions say, which is that you need to go to home screen, press the menu or settings button. You need to find your settings somehow. You need to then go into the um, de the developer screen. Some of you will see a screen right on your settings that says developer. Many devices don't have the developer screen right away. It's hidden until you do this. You have to go to settings, about the phone, and you're going to see something that says build number. You have to tap that seven times. As you're tapping it, it eventually says two more taps and you're a developer. You tap it, tap it, tap it, you get seven and it says welcome, you're a developer. What that does is it then gives you a new menu that says developer options. So let me see if I can show that to you here. I am going to run a virtual device just so that you have something to look at. I can't show you my device here, really. And remember, I ask everyone, please mute your devices. You can hear a lot of splashing and funny sounds. Please mute your devices. Um, so again, if you've got a device, let's try to do this. If you don't, just wait a moment. But we're going to first set up our device as a developer mode. Just waiting for this to load up, but that's why I've got instructions so that you can try this at your own pace also. So I know that on mine I, I swipe from the top and then I can select settings. <coughs> and on mine I don't have the, the developer options, so I have to do that seven tap trick. So let's see here. On this particular, let's say this is your device. You're on your home screen. You're gonna, in one possible way, you can go to your apps. Yeah, this one's not going to cooperate. Um, you need to go to your settings. <coughs> you have to go to your settings. This one is not going to cooperate here. Again, I'm not going to be able to show you this exactly, but on your device, go to your settings, go all the way to the bottom, you might see something that says developer options. You might see it. If you don't see it, my instructions say, okay, instead you need to first go to about phone. On the about phone screen, uh, you should see something that says um, build number. On mine, it's at the very bottom. And I have to tap it seven times. One, two, three, four, five. And it's going to give you a little message as you're tapping. It's going to say, you know, a few more taps until you're a developer. Eventually you'll tap it and it says, you're a developer. You have to then back up one previous screen. And then now you're going to see a screen that says developer options. The point of developer options is that within that menu, you have a bunch of these settings as a developer. Again, this is not jailbreaking your phone. This is just activating it as a developer. One of the options that you will see is USB debugging. <coughs> USB debugging. It's off by default because what you have is a consumer device out of the store you want a developer device, which is simply tapping USB debugging, then you'll get a big scary warning that says USB debugging is intended for development purposes only. Use it to copy data between your computer and your device. Install apps on your device without notification and read log data. So in theory, if you put it on developer mode and you hang around on the internet and someone sends you some interesting file uh, and you tap on it, it could install itself and now you've got this new app on your phone that you don't want. So this developer mode, we should turn it on when we're in class working on this stuff. When we're done at the end of the day, we want to turn it off so that we're not 
vulnerable to possibly getting an app we don't want. Now, in this room, we are developers and we're sideloading apps, we know what we're doing, but it's a good idea to turn it off after the class. So I'm going to say, okay, I know that. So now I've got USB debugging. Mine also has an option for stay awake, because it's annoying every time it goes to sleep and I want to check my app. Sometimes the app doesn't install because it's asleep. But since you're going to be plugged in with your USB cable, it's going to be charging. So if you leave it on stay awake and plugged in, you're not going to drain your battery. So let's take a quick pause here. Anyone having any trouble with this first step here? Anyone need a little help? Okay, so that's step one of this process. Step two, this one is also going to be much variable for us. We need, well, after that's set, then I'll just go back home. Um, after that's set to developer mode, I haven't plugged it in yet, I need to get the, cro the proper USB driver, the OEM USB driver, the original equipment manufacturer driver. Oftentimes, let's say I've got an LG whatever, uh, oftentimes you have the consumer version of the software which is for you to upload your music to it and back up your contacts and that basic consumer stuff. Then there's the more powerful developer's OEM USB driver, the one that lets you do this extra stuff that we're doing. So this is where you are going to need to figure out what is your right driver for your device. There is some help that could possibly get you there by following that link. It'll be a list of all of the big manufacturers and a link hopefully directly to download the correct driver. You follow that link or you do a search. You go online and you search for Motorola Moto E OEM USB driver. You want specifically the OEM USB driver of your device. And with that bit of searching, hopefully you come across your, your driver. If you've got a Motorola device, it looks like they've got a universal one. So if you search for Motorola universal driver, if you've got a Motorola, you want to search for Motorola universal driver, and it should be the result. Where can I download the USB drivers of my device? That's the one for the Moto E and just about every other Motorola device. You find the driver, you download it, save it to your USB, because remember, these computers have deep freeze. We're going to set this driver up today, and when you come back next time, you're going to have to set it again, and the next time again, and the next time again. It's not going to remember your device. So remember, if you find your correct driver, save it so that you don't lose it. You download it, and there'll be some sort of installation process. So this is the one for all the motor, Motorola phones, Windows, Mac. Let's say I downloaded it, I get a file on my desktop, I double-click it to start the installation, and I just do all the defaults. Whatever it is, just do all the defaults of the driver. <coughs> and so what you've done is you've allowed your computer to communicate with your device as a developer. <clears throat> after you've uh, turned this into a developer device and after the driver, then you plug it in. And the computer will then probably pop up to tell you it's recognizing a device. Um, hopefully, it then will pop up to tell you that you've got your, your device running. If it says something about autoplay, you can ignore it. As it's recognizing the driver, keep an eye out for something that might say something like ADB interface. 
that's the Android uh, debug um, interface. So when you plug it in, and if it doesn't say something related to ADB, you might not have set it up properly. And you don't get any feedback really that says you're set up. You, you don't know if you're fully set up until we actually install an app. We'll do that in a moment. But what you might also see, either when you plug it in, or oftentimes when you're about to run the app on the device, keep an eye out on your device. A screen might pop up that says one more time, allow US debu debugging from this computer. And you want to say yes. And there's going to be a button that says, remember this setting. So again, I can't show you this exactly. Every device is different. But you might get a little pop-up that says, allow debugging from this computer. Say yes. Save that setting. Click OK. And then it should be able to fully work. Again, we're not going to be able to fully test this. We're a little bit blind at the moment. What we're going to do is create, uh, create uh, an, an app. And then we're going to run it either on a, on a real device or a virtual device. We're going to set up a virtual device for those of us that didn't bring a device in a moment. And so we're either going to use a real device or a virtual device, either or, but we need an app to then deploy it. Then we will fully know if it works. So we're going to be in suspense for a little bit. Did it fully work? So at this point, um, again, everyone's going to vary a little bit. But maybe I'll just do like one minute, two minutes at the most, if you've got a device to try it. How many of you did bring a device today? A and the cable? Okay, good. So anyone having any trouble? Any Anything weird, maybe, if you're trying it? All right, so check things out for a moment, and then we'll, <coughs> then we'll create a virtual device, and create an app, and then we'll be on our way.
Anyone else trying the hardware? So whenever we do this, it is a bit of a road bump, but after we've got it working, then it's pretty smooth. So either you're going to use your real device uh, the way we're about to do here, or we're going to use a virtual device. So what I'm going to do is, for those of you that are still kind of working a bit on your real device, I'm going to talk to the people that are going to use a virtual device so that we're all in the same place because we want to have either the virtual or the real one working then we want to have an app and install it and then we will see if we're really working so what I want to do then for people that don't have a real device what you want to do is um, on your on your computer go ahead and open computer window this isn't one of the handouts but we'll do it like this uh, open up computer window local disk C you will see then a folder called program files x86 
Yes, there is something that says Android there. Ignore that. That's the other class. Program files x86. And in here you will see Android. This is our software. Open up Android inside of the x86 folder. You'll see then Android SDK Windows. And then you will see AVD Manager. There's your Android Virtual Device Manager. So double click AVD Manager. You'll see a quick flash of command prompt for a moment. And then what you'll see is this screen full of templates. And we've got one virtual device, this default one. When you went home and you tried to do it, you probably didn't have this, de this device. So you had to create a virtual one as per my instructions. We're going to create one together again, so you're used to it. From here, you switch over to the Devices tab. You've got virtual devices, the ones that are created. And you've got device definitions, which I think of them as templates. We've got all of these templates. And in this class, we're going to be using the basic low-end one, just because it's faster to set up and such. If your computer is able to run a Nexus 10, OK, great. But I'm going to talk about the use of the basic one. So scroll down, and you're going to find, eventually, you're going to get to a 3.2-inch QVGA ADP2, not the HVGA one, the Q. VGA 3.2, ADP2, not ADP1. So if you click once on that one, create AVD. You can change that name there if you want, doesn't matter. Don't change the device. On target, you want Google APIs, and then that'll recognize the Google CPU. Slightly different than my instructions, but that's what we need to do here. At home, follow my instructions as is, and it should work. Leave the hardware keyboard. Skin, select the first one. Skin with dynamic hardware controls. Can't have a front camera, so don't worry. Back camera, we'll need to select emulated, because your computers do not have a camera. But if you're on your own home computer, you've got a web camera, probably on your laptop, and you can select webcam. But here you select emulated. Don't worry about changing memory, RAM, or internal storage. But we do want to insert a memory card. Any size doesn't matter, but my hand's already next to 99, so I'll type 99. Don't even make those anymore, but that's OK. Just the memory card size. And as I said, we don't need snapshot or host GPU. If you were at home and you were trying to create a virtual device, how many of you tried to create a virtual device at home? And how many of you were able to create a virtual device? OK. And how many of you did it run well? And how many for you did it run slow or not at all? So you see the range of, of people um, of what uh, your capabilities are. But using the host GPU might speed your system up. We don't need it here, so we will just uh, proceed, click OK. That gives you the feedback that you've created a virtual device. Click OK on that. And now you've got two, the one that was already there and the one you just created, the AVD32. So click on that one, 3.2 inch. And on the right side, click Start. And launch it. So at this point, you will either have a virtual device to work with or a real device. You could do both if you'd like. Um, so anyone having any trouble at this point creating virtual? Yes. Yes, exactly. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to move on here now. If, uh, if you're not quite there, I'm going to need to move on. And if you're helping your neighbors, please do it at a little quieter level. Guys? So um, what we want here is we've got this virtual device. And if you've got this virtual device running, eventually it'll say welcome. I'll just click got it. So I've got a virtual device. I can bring my real device. Or if you brought a real device, you can use your real device. Either or. And uh, once I've got this virtual device running, I don't want to shut it down. It takes a moment to start back up again. So I just want it hanging around there while I get my work done, and when I'm ready to use it, it'll be there ready. If you created your real device, uh, if you've set up your real device, you won't know if it fully works until the step we're about to do right now. So I've got my virtual device. I'll leave it there. My, my AVD manager, I'm just going to close it for the moment. Leave the virtual device. And this folder that we were looking at for the SDK manager, you can close that also. I'm just going to leave open my virtual device. So we're going to get back into the workflow of creating a project and launching it. And then I'll give you another handout where we will actually then create our template file and, and get started. I want to kind of repeat ourselves a little bit, the first, the first few two lectures, to get used to this process, and then we're going to get up and running. So remind me, how do I get back to the command prompt like we were last time? Start. And then start typing node. And you're going to see a result that says node.js command prompt. Go ahead and click on that one. Not the one that says node.exe. The one that says node command prompt. And there we go, command prompt. So you've got a command prompt and it says user lab. I want to create a quick, just a quick concept, proof of concept uh, project on my desktop. I'm currently not on the desktop in the command prompt. I need to change to the desktop. CD space desktop. Press enter. So now I'm on the desktop. I'm going to create a brand new taco project. Taco, what's next? Create, what's next? The name of a project, which we will just call test01. Anyone remember what else we should have here? We want to have the package ID, com dot your last name, the name of the folder, test01. Can I use a first name? Any sure. Name? Any yeah. name. Dot net, dot biz, dot com, first name, last name, doesn't matter at all. It's a unique identifier for, for you. Space. And now, in quotes, we can put the name of the um, project in uppercases and all of that. So quote, end quote, and then I'll back up and call it test01. So that's the more complete way to do this. Taco create test one would have worked, but we would have gotten a project called Hello Taco. Here now we've created a project called test one, which is in quotes. At this point, go ahead and press enter. And again, because it's the first time we do it today, it might be a bit slow. Uh, you might get a pop up that says, Would you like to contribute use of statistics? Doesn't matter if you do or not. Today I'll put yes, why not? If you don't want to, put no and press enter. And then it'll connect and download the software. And the first time we do it, it might be a little slow. We'll let that happen. Is everyone on track here? Is everyone getting your taco project set up? Thank you. 
Some of you may happen very fast, uh, but some of you may take a little longer, so just wait until it says success. So, um, eventually mine here says success. The following commands, I have to do them in the folder, the folder I just created, which we called test01, right? We did create test01. We've created a folder for our project. So the following commands that it tells us here you should change into the directory, add a platform, and then build it, and you're done. So change to the directory. CD, space, the name of the folder, test01. Enter. And then now I'm inside the folder, test01. We're going to work with an Android project, so taco platform. Add Android and then enter. Taco platform add Android. And uh, it'll do some processing and tell you it's building it and then eventually success. Taco build is uh, optional. Because if you do taco run or taco emulate, it does a build anyway. So we're going to skip that. If you've got a virtual device, type taco emulate Android. If you've got a real device, this is what you're going to see now if this really worked. If you've got a real device, you're going to do taco run Android. So emulate Android, you've got an emulator and run Android if you've got a real device. So this is where we'll see. I'm going to try on my real device. Taco run Android. And like I said, keep an eye out on your device because you might get a secondary pop-up that says, would you like to debug from your device, from this computer? Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes if you don't answer that in time, this crashes because it's waiting for you to say OK. And again, the first time it might give you a bunch of Pac-Man dots right there because um, it's setting up all the stuff. Yes. So this is uh, supposed to say add this computer? Exactly. Oh. Yes. Click OK on that and it should then uh, let you from this computer add to it. Yes. It was uh, Taco Run Android.
the first time you do all of this, it might be a bit slow, so we're going to talk about shortcuts a little bit later. But here, we're doing it the long way, obviously, in the first way, the first time it seems convoluted, but as you do it more often, it starts to hopefully stick and, uh, and hopefully make sense. Question? Yes. Platform. In other words, here we're creating the device. What if I wanted to use a different device? Or well, let's say I have four or five devices already set up. You know, where does that, that link? It'll try to install itself to the one that's running. So if you've got one running, it'll try to latch onto that one. Right. If you don't have any of them running, you can select when you do taco emulate. You can put an extra dash and mention which device. You have to say, I believe, dash dash AVD equals, and then the name of your device. And then you can pick the right device. OK, so mine's coming. 1 minute, 49 seconds, installing onto device. Something's happening on my device here. Cordova. So how many of you worked? Raise your phones. I didn't get that, but I got it. Just one moment. How many of you raised? I got it. Let me let me take a quick look at that. Okay. So a few, a few of you got it. Great. Possible problem that sometimes happens that I notice is if you've got a virtual device running, and uh, Android here, it might put it onto the virtual device instead of your. So here's another possible thing you could do: Taco Run, Android space dash dash device that should hopefully force it to the device. So if it didn't work for you, if it didn't run in an emulator or on a device, and you want to give it a little help?
Is there a regular USB and so you can connect to a device? And then there's actual device. That's what the OEM driver is. Because I had to do it when I first connected it. Connected like regular USB driver. So it knew what it was for me. So it's OEM. Yeah. So it's OEM. Yeah. So it's All right, so what we should have is either your emulator displaying your basic Cordova project or uh, your device. So I've got it on my device here. Did you notice that uh, if, you, if your device is un unlocked uh, on the device, if you rotate it, the, the app also rotates like that. So that's pretty cool. On the emulator, I close mine, but on the emulator, you can also rotate your emulator. Um, you have to press, uh, I believe, on the number keyboard. Uh, try pressing the number 9 on the number keyboard. Did, did that rotate it? Okay, and then press 7 to rotate it back up. If it doesn't rotate back up, turn off your num lock. So it's 7, 
and it's 9. On the number keypad on the side, not on the top. On the side, try the 9 and the 7, and that's supposed to rotate it. And, and if it's not, turn off your number, your num lock. All right, so let's do this now. Let's um, let's um, we created a project on the desktop, and um, we've got it there hanging out. So what we're going to do is make a little change and then redeploy it. So on your desktop, do you notice if you look on your desktop, because we told it to create a project on the desktop, I've got a folder called test01. So do you guys see your test01 folder there? All right, so here we go. So on my desktop, I've got a folder called test01. You should do, you should also right there. So your whole project right now is that test01. Go ahead and double click that. We saw this previously, but what we're going to look at different this time is one of the most important files of the whole project is right here, config.xml. We're going to look at that file, see what it's about, make a few changes, and we'll see what's important about it. Uh, so this is XML, which is related to HTML. So we can use Notepad for this. Right click your config.xml file. And select edit with Notepad++. And what you get here is a file with about 96 lines of code. And what we got here is the configuration file for our core project, which can then, using Taco, be deployed to every platform. Notice line 2. Well, line one just specifies it's an XML file. That's a little familiar, like when we created the HTML5 document, we had the doc type of HTML5. Here's the doc type, so to speak, of XML. But the good stuff starts on line two. Widget, ID, that looks familiar. Didn't you type that when you created Taco Create? <laughs> yes. So if you want to change your package ID name, if someone did take that name up on the Google Play Store, here's how you change it. You just go back to the XML file, config XML, change that and you've got a new ID. You don't need to type any taco stuff. There is a version number here, 001. This can be any number here, any way you want to do version numbers. You know, this can be version 1.0 or 1.01 .01, or you can even do like 1.1a. You, you can put whatever string you want here actually. A little bit later, we'll talk about we have to also add the Android version code. We'll get to that in a bit. Definition of the XML widget, the rest of that, don't worry. So really, if you wanted to change some deep stuff about your app, you would change widget ID or version. You typed test01 in quotes, which is the name that appears below the icon. On your device, I forgot to say, but if you, if you have your... If you had your actual device and you install the app to the device, then you go over to your back to your apps screen. So on the virtual device, if you take it back to the to the home screen, and on your virtual device, if you go back home and then you tap on the button for apps, which is this little uh, uh, button here with six. For some reason, mine doesn't doesn't load up. I hope yours does. If it doesn't, that's okay. But if you were able to load that little screen you would see your apps icon right there and it would have the name of your app 
whatever you typed it. I can't show you, for some reason mine crashes. But on my real device, I see it right here. It says test 01 and it's got the little Cordova mascot. That name below your icon is line 3, which is what we typed when we typed taco create test 1 com victor quotes test 1. What we wrote in quotes is that name right there. So if we made a mistake or want to give it a brand new name, that's where we change it. We can type anything we want here. Test one of my amazing app. And your, your app would have that name below its icon. The problem with that, of course, don't type it, is that then you have this huge name that's going to get cut off. You look at the, if you look at your, if you have a real Android device or an iPhone, you, these apps don't have a huge name. They may have officially a big name. Facebook Messenger. But here it's just Messenger because it's got the icon and a little bit of text to show you what it is. So you don't have to put a huge name there because it's going to get cut off. Part of your icon, the, the icon and the text should be enough for you. Like what I'm looking at right here, it's funny, Play Movies. So Google Play Movies is actually cutting off. They didn't think of it themselves. I've got Microsoft App and it cuts off on the P. So you want to eventually think of having a nice compact name how many characters? I can't exactly tell you because these fonts are not proportional. They're not fixed width, that is. They are proportional. The letter W takes up more space than the letter L. And L is a nice little thin letter where a W is a big wide letter. So I can't tell you write seven characters because what if you've got seven W's? Four of them are going to cut off. The point here is short memorable names is what you want. And then when we design the app icon, that's the other bit of branding. Description. This one says, a blank project that uses Apache Cordova to help you build an app that targets multiple mobile platforms. Android, iOS, Windows, and Windows Phone. You can change that to whatever you want. You don't need to at the moment. That's descriptive text that might appear in, for example, the info of the app that most people will never see. They're actually using the app. They're not playing around under settings that could show up under settings or the app store. We will edit that later, but that's the description of your app. And I don't believe you have a tangible limit, probably a thousand characters, but no one's ever really going to look at it, so you don't need that much text. Line 5. This is something that will change a little later. And again, it's not going to be visible to the average user, but it's something that Google will see. Author's email. So at some point, we're going to put your email there, and it's currently going to dev at cordova.apache href, the Cordova homepage. So eventually, we're going to put your email address and your website. If you don't have a website, that's fine. You can leave it empty, I think, uh, or put example.com. But if you're going to be publishing apps and to take it the full way that you're, a de you're an app developer, go buy a website for $20 a year if you're an app developer. And then some text. Who is actually the author? Apache Cordova team. Eventually, we'll put the name of your company there. You don't have the name of a company. You're going to invent one eventually, and you're a company. Number six says the very first bit of content that is displayed when the app loads up is index.html. That's the standard name of the first page of any website. So when we work on a project, we have to make sure that the home page that we design is called index.html. Or we can come to our code and change it to be, you know, victor.html. I would recommend don't change line 6 and get used to using your first page as index.html. That's standard. Don't worry about access origin at the moment. Splash screen. Do you notice that when you, or did you notice when you loaded up your app the first time, you saw the Cordova mascot for a moment, and then it loaded to say Cor the mascot and Cordova? You had seen a splash screen for a moment. If you want to see it again on your real device, you have to find out how to force shut down your app. Uh, I can't tell you for everyone. Everyone's device is different. On mine, my Motorola, I tap on the little square icon, that pulls up my last apps that have loaded up, and then I swipe it to the right to force shut it down. 
The point of that is that then when I launch my app again, which is in my app drawer, it will load it up as if it's a brand new app, splash screen, and then the front screen. The point of that was just to show there's a little splash screen that shows up briefly, and then my main app. That's what line 8 is saying, display a spra splash screen. If you don't want a splash screen, we remove that line. If you think about it, most of the time when you load an app, there is a moment, uh, maybe one second, maybe two seconds, where there's a little bit of a splash screen, a little graphic, some advertising to catch your attention, to do branding, and then the app starts. So I'm going to leave this, but if you don't want it, it can be removed. Question? Can you customize the splash screen? Definitely. Right now we've got the Cordova mascot splash screen, but we're going to replace that with our own cool splash screen. Because this is a Cordova project that can go to every app or every device, there's a preference here. This, is, this app is going to target Windows version 8.1 and Windows Phone 8.1. So if we went through the process of also doing Taco, Platform, Add, Windows, we would have a Windows app as well as an Android app. If we do Taco, Platform, Add, iOS, we have an iPhone app. And so here it's saying, okay, we're going to target Windows 8. And maybe you want to target Windows 10. How do you think you change that? Value equals 10. So we'll leave that alone for the moment. Yes? So if without doing the adding each platform, is, I mean, for the preferences, would you add the iOS and the other ones there too? The defaults that come here are really good. You usually don't have to add very much to it. Okay. So whatever is here, is good. Yes. What is this target? Does that mean the minimum target? The minimum yes. The minimum yes, exactly. Um, the minimum version. And we will specifically say, we'll add a line of code a little bit later to specifically say minimum version. Right here, for Windows, we have to specify it this way. Windows target version. It's the minimum target of Windows. When we do Android, the code is slightly different uh, because, you know, I don't really want to uh, target all the way back to Android 2.0. I want to start on Android 4 and higher. Yes, I will exclude some population of users, but we can look it up on Google.com, Android.com, exactly how many we're excluding, and it's not going to be worth it to try to support people that have, you know, a seven-year-old phone. Don't worry about Cordova plugin whitelist. Allow intents and all of this. Um, this is able. This is our app is able to open websites. Our app can reach out to the internet and open websites, insecure and secure websites. Our app is also able to dial. If you've got a phone number on your on your app, all you have to do is don't type this. But let's say we've got a phone number. Uh, all we would need to do, you know, I've got one, two, three. I've got a phone number. We would make it like in like an A tag, but instead of href, tell equals, and then the phone number. And that'll activate a phone number in our app because we have the ability to launch phone numbers from our app. Um, so again, don't type this, but that's what that's saying. Let us, set, let us dial a phone number from within our app. Let us send a text message from our app. Let us send an email from our app. Let us tap into geolocation features. Let us tap into a map in our app. All of these exist and apply to all of the platforms, iPhone, Android, Windows, unless specifically marked for a specific platform. So they will either say something like, this is just for Windows, Windows phones, pay attention here, uh, Android phone, ignore this. And you're going to see it also sometimes marked like this, platform name. This stuff that's inside of this tag, the platform tag, any stuff in here will only apply to Android, will only apply to iOS, and so forth. So everything in those blocks only applies to those platforms. So I've got here, allow intent market. This will allow us to open the Google Play App Store. It used to be called Android Marketplace. So it's still got the old name there. But this is saying if you add a link in your app that says market colon slash slash and the name of an app on the App Store, it will launch your App Store app and pull it up right on the App Store. 
very similar here for iOS, ITMS, iTunes Market Shop, or whatever that stands for, and ITMS apps. So we'll able we'll able to, let's say, advertise our other apps from within one app, and we add a link from this one app to a link back to the other app, and they can go and download it right away. You've got another section called Platform Name Android. So this is only for Android. And this is a little section that displays the icons, the icons of the app, the, the icon that you see where you have it installed with all your other apps. Um, let's back up for a moment here. Go back to your window of your app. Go back to your Explorer window. Go inside of the res folder. Icons folder. Android folder. Res, icons, Android, icon 96, XHCPI, right there. So if we want to put our own icon, if we're tired of the little Android mascot, two things we can do. We can design an app, at the icons, put them into this folder, and let's say I call that my cool icon. Well, then I have to go to my code here and say blah 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 slash my cool icon. Or, Leave the code alone and change the icons. We're going to take a day where we're going to do that. We're going to fire up Photoshop, draw some icons, drop those icons into this folder with those names to erase the old icons. And then we don't need to edit the code. I don't want to accidentally break my code. So I'm going to leave the code alone and I'm going to add new icons to that folder. And when I do Taco Run, it'll use my new icons. Question? Yeah, I have a question, sir. I think there's some other ones, but like, what are you, what are you thinking of that might be not, that might not be there? I think we are able to add our own custom ones, and that's tied into line 12, 11, which I skipped, which is the whitelist. This a whitelist is a list of allowed things. So I think we can add our own intents. We have to then work with the whitelist. Usually we don't need to because all of these will cover just about everything we need. But I think we can do custom ones with more work. Mm -hmm. So later on we'll update our icons, but that's where they are. They're in that folder of our app inside of res, inside of blah blah blah, icons. Further below that then you've got the whole platform for iOS, and this one's huge because the iPhone has a lot of different versions and retina size and all of that stuff. But it's the same thing. I'm not going to touch that code. I'm going to design my icons, the sizes that, need it, that they need to be, and then drop them into the appropriate folder to replace the old ones, and I've got my icons. But notice this one's got the 72 pixel size, one double size for retina, and the regular non-retina and the small size one, and the small one here, and this and that. So there's a bunch of different sizes for the iPhone. Notice all of these are saved as PNGs, or PINGs. These are high-quality, lossless graphics with transparency. And again, we'll do this together later, but I'm just showing you here, we're going to be able to customize everything about our app. Then there's a section for Windows. So if you've got Windows, um, the thing is that with the modern Windows, you can have Windows on your computer and Windows on your phone. So this one that says Windows is for the computer. You can create Windows apps, um, not just mobile apps. You can create apps that someone will download on their Windows computer based on HTML and such. And so here it needs a bunch of these little icons too. And there's the store logo one, and the wide one, and the square one. Again, that's not so complicated to update. We just need some little little bit of graphics skills. And not even that. We can use a lot of clip art and stuff. Then there's the Windows Phone version of it. So if anyone's got Windows Phone, I know at least one other person here representing, um, <laughs> you uh, can get your Windows, uh, you can get your project up on a Windows Phone. Question? Question back on the Windows computer. Yeah. Um, where does it download to? 
Christmas. Whenever, whenever we do this taco run, it's creating a specific dot file. For Android, it creates a dot apk. For Windows, I believe it's a dot apx. So it gives you the file of your app, and it puts it somewhere in the folder, which I'll show where. When this whole process is done in month three, we're going to take that file and log into the App Store and upload it to the App Store for anyone in the world to be able to download it. And then we've got a little section, Platform, Android, and this is all about the splash screen. Notice this one says Splash, and up here these are icons. These are the icons for the app, and this is the splash screen for the app. There's the landscape versions and the portrait versions in low DPI, medium DPI, high DPI, extra high DPI. I don't know why they didn't put it in order. It doesn't matter the order it's in really, but I would have liked it. Low, medium, extra, and extra high. For those splash windows, that's in the screen folder? Exactly. If you back up to your folder here and go back to res, screens, Android, we saw those last time, and those are the splash screens. What are the dimensions? When we do it together, we'll see, but you can easily see that if you click on a graphic, it'll tell you down here, 72960. Notice again, they're all pings, not GIFs, those are limited color. Not JPEGs, those degrade. Pings, full color, lossless, uh, high quality graphics. Splash screen for iOS, splash screen for Windows, and then at the very end, widget ends, the app ends. So XML, it's, uh, it's like HTML in that it has tags, often pairs of tags. It's different than HTML in that XML, basically you invent tags. And it's up to the device or the parser or, or whatever, the build tools, to interpret those tags. So Taco takes the platform tag and knows what to do with it because platform tag does not make does not is has no meaning on a website. The web browser doesn't doesn't understand the platform tag. Our build tools do, and it means okay, take this splash screen and put it on the Windows folder. But this config file basically controls controls your whole app, and we're going to add to it a little bit later. I've got a handout about that, but I wanted to let you aware of that because this is um, how you control many of these aspects of your app. At this point we've either got a virtual device running or a real device. We're going to get some real work done right now, so uh, we're going to take our first break. I'm going to put uh, some new handouts in the folder. I'm going to turn the printer on. I recommend you get a copy of these handouts because now we're going to get into high gear. So I put sheet number four and number five. If you'd like a copy, it's in the folder now. Number four and number five. We're back at 750.